What I want to do is create my greatest creation to create the most amount of freedom I possibly can for humanity. That's my newest thing, like, you know, and that's what I want to do. I'm like, how do I maximize and give as many people as possible this feeling of, it's, you know, financial freedom is a big part of that. How do I deliver that to as many people as possible? You need to work on your product. The product's the ultimate marketing. The product's the ultimate hack. What you do is you go back up the chain and you go to actually changing the product itself to be unique, different, compelling, so is that it has cut through. It starts from a culture of constantly reinventing yourself. If you look at me over time, I'm always moving, I'm always reinventing myself continuously because the darkest place in the world is just outside the spotlight. Just make one improvement. Just one. And I'm like, oh, I suppose we could do that. Let's say there's 220 working days in the year, roughly, give or take. If you do 220 improvements, you're probably gonna get some. And so I was always just saying to everyone, like, I just want one thing to everyone. I just say, do one thing today, get one thing out. And that turned into this go live culture. All right, guys, this is a massive episode. We have Fred Shabesta, the founder and chairman of finder.com.au. He's a man, one of the most successful Aussie entrepreneurs ever. He's got a nine-figure net worth and the and Finder itself is valued at $650 million. So this guy has crazy value, anything internet-related, crypto-related. It's a really awesome episode. So we'll get into it. I'll leave the intro short. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, do me a favor, please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you're listening on an audio platform, if you could leave us a five-star review, I really appreciate it. Let's get into the episode. Let's do it. All right, we're back with another podcast. This is episode 101. So very special episode 101. We've got a, uh, one of the biggest guests, the icon of the Australian business scene. I'd say one of the most successful Australian entrepreneurs of the entire internet era. He's the founder of finder.com, one of the Australia's most visited comparison websites, Fred Shabesta. Welcome to the podcast and welcome back to the podcast game in general. I'm honored that your first one back in a year or so is with us. So thanks very much. Oh yeah, it's good to be back, Dylan. And, and um, if you're listening to this right now, you're hitting the right podcast because this is the one I wanted to come back to. Exactly. We, there was a lot of competition. We had to put a big tender in to get the first podcast with Fred back. I but, said um, a lot of no's. Yeah, he does. Well, we, we, we had to follow you up for a bit. That's what we got to do for the big guests. You know what I mean? It's been... 100 episodes in and I spoke to the boys. I'm like, look, if we're going to do this shit, we sort of started the process, just wanted to get the reps in. And then the last few months were like, if we're going to keep doing this, we're only going to do it at the highest level with the best possible guests so we can continue to bring to bring Bay for people. Our audience is very much uh, internet focused entrepreneurs. I'm, I'm from the e-com space myself. A lot of people just wanting to get into business are in business and want to know how to navigate this wild thing that we call um, business. So I want to first start with you. And you're one of the OGs of the of the internet space, building websites back in the late 90s, way before probably any of my listeners were. I want to know for you, because you've been very much a visionary on the forefront of everything with the internet. When did you first fall in love with the internet and see the passion for everything it could build and everything you could create off the back of it? I remember um, I used to um, dial up on a modem you know, like, and it was, we're paying $5 yeah. an hour. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was the normal going rate. For, Is that like at home or in like internet cafe? Yeah, at home. Yeah. You'd pay, you'd, the, the, the internet cafes were not that popular back mm -hmm. then. So you'd, you'd pay five bucks an hour and you'd connect and you'd load one or two pages and get a bit <laughs> of information and you'd look at Yahoo a lot Yeah. Um, back then. And I just remember loading this thing and then I, I saw this button and I clicked view source on the mm -hmm. page. Uh, and back then, they, they, they've always had that. Yeah. Um, this is probably like 96, 97. Yeah. And I just saw, saw this code. And I was like, it reminded me of when I was in year five and I was about, um, uh, actually before that probably, yeah, about year five. And I was, you know, 10 years old and I was hacking um, basic little games on microbees. Yeah. yeah. This, is a, this is a computer system that doesn't exist. I'm not okay. sure if it exists anymore. I think Microbeak, the computer company, might. But anyway, that's Honeywell. But anyway, they I used to make these games and, I, and, I, and this flashback came back to me and I said, well, I should just start hacking this as well because this will be fun. Mm -hmm. And I just started messing around with it and started loading up these files and playing around with these websites. I didn't know what the code did, but it just naturally occurred to me to like start messing around with it. And I was like so enthralled because if I put this thing up, for the first time, this is, this is, sounds unusual, but you know, we had no smartphones. Yeah, nothing. No one took any photos. No one said no one, you couldn't take it. a video and a photo was like either film or digital camera, mm -hmm. which came later. So if you took a photo, it took, it, it took quite a bit of transmission to get to someone. And so this was the first time I thought, okay, what if I like imagine I put this up? I can go and send this to someone, and they can go and see it instantly. So it's like faster communication, which which sounds 
obvious today. Yeah, of course. But back then I was like, just, I was just enthralled that you can, I can do something and someone else can see it all around the world, literally instantaneously. And that was a revolution. So that for you, were you like just playing with it because you, you really enjoyed it and it was fun or were you already like the entrepreneurial side of your brain thinking, hey, this is going to become the future. I want to skill up in this and learn how to hack these codes and play around with it with the view of starting a business or was it just purely from play and exploring these this new tech that you found interesting? I, I was just playing around with it. Uh, I messed around. Like as a kid, I, I used to climb trees. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like a – I don't think I'm a natural – entrepreneur that goes and like you know okay. tries to find angles turns like everything that. into a business yeah yeah like i think oh, well, i naturally it does happen mm -hmm. like i can i can think like that might as well but it's more like where i come from is the curiosity mm. like i used to like set fire to things yeah. and like you know ride bikes and skateboards and just like explore the world and experiment with things and mess with code and take things apart and sometimes put them back together. Like, <laughs> if like, you could figure that feed out, I still, yeah. still were bothered enough yeah. to do it. And so, so creating websites was like, this is super fun. Mm -hmm. This is like something someone else has crafted. Oh, I want to know how they've crafted that and I'm going to take it apart. And then I thought, hey, what if I go and make something? And I remember I, the first site I've ever made was a GeoCities site mm -hmm. and I put a picture of my friend. <laughs> I took a photo of him on a digital camera and yeah. I put a picture of him on the internet and I sent him the link and he was like, whoa, what is that? This is like witchcraft back then, right? Yeah. Everyone's like, Everyone's what like, is this There's no stuff? way. What have you done here? <laughs> like, Oh, and, dude, that's the best. Yeah, so it's it's a bit like and, – and, and, and if I was to go to modern, you know, I always think of it as in fractals. Everything sort of repeats in different mm – -hmm. and I think cryptocurrency and blockchain is similar to that. I think AI is similar. I'm not as deep in AI as crypto. I'm mm -hmm. like very deep yeah. in crypto. It's a similar – repeat it's like early yes like everyone's thinking of it as a scam mm -hmm. like early on the internet everyone's like oh that's a scam that's where scammers go and it's a fad like it's not yeah, gonna come it's not gonna be around you know and like i was like deeply enthralled <laughs> in this thing yeah and um it was like a good toy you know um and i think that i remember like <laughs> yeah at one point i stopped going to university that was probably you know after i left school i I just sort of went, oh, I think I want to do this. And I started coding and I started coding. I uh, actually, I had one um, course at uni where I learned databases and I went home and instantly started coding databases. Yeah. And I stopped doing the university course because they wanted to do an offline database. And I was like, nah, online database. And then I just didn't turn up and I just built this, this company basically out of the back of it. Not, not Finder, but another company. Yeah. So like building websites back then, very different to your Shopify drags and drops and how easy <laughs> oh, yeah. it is now. No, yeah, yeah. What, when did that like passion for just creating things, breaking things, playing around with the code, building websites, when did that first turn into like a commercial business? Was it, was like the freestyle media your first business or was there other things that you had before you created that? No, that was the first one. I, my, um, I was playing around with the internet, yeah. you know, making little websites and um, we used to, so there's no WordPress. We used to do frame sets and that's, <laughs> that's like. Yeah, that's before my time. Yeah. I didn't even, Yui's, Yui's a big website nerd. He loves all that stuff. We as should, well. He's yeah. big into the internet culture, but you even know that? No, oh, we should build, I should build a frame set site just for, I don't know if it <laughs> yeah. works anymore, but that yeah, Who still, knows? Uh, we used to, we, you know, there was no jQuery. It, we used to use um, Macromedia and Dreamweaver and anyway, and we used to learn from the program writing the code. Mm -hmm. It would teach us because no one, there's no one to teach you. Yeah. There's no, Especially back then. There's no courses. No. There's no way to turn up. There's no GA or. Yeah. I went to the first course at Macquarie Uni on internet um, coding. When was that? That was in 2003. Yeah. Uh, 2002. And I just turned up and I never went to any of the lectures. I get the assignment and I would just hand code it. Send, immediately submit it back in and then leave. And then I turned up to the exam and I literally just wrote the exam because mm -hmm. I was so far ahead. Yeah, yeah. I didn't – like everything – like I knew the language. It mm -hmm. was just – I was just in a right place, right time. I always think all of this stuff comes down to timing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I got into poker po – selling poker tables, poker chips in, mm -hmm. in, in, in an e-com store. Yeah. We did that back in um, – that 06, 05, 06. That was where Texas Holden really took off. Yeah, yeah. But you can't ship to poker tables around. It's terrible. When you were doing like e-com brands back then, like where were you driving traffic from? Like there wasn't like a Facebook you can run ads or anything like that. Where are you actually finding people to come to these sites to, to buy these products? Google. And, Google. and Google. we used to use email a lot. Okay. Um, you know, back then, this is going to sound like um, it's probably 2000 and 
um, 2005, 2006. Um, I used to send faxes. Faxes, that's a blast from the past. Well, yeah. like faxes it, were really good. Yeah, well, the open rate on like a fax or an email back then, I'm sure, is super like high. super high. Yeah. And how did you like build the email list back then? Like, was it just like enthusiasts on the internet? Like, they would find you, or was it all just Google ads? Like, how did you actually create the hype back then? So early, like yeah. people starting businesses now are blessed. There's a million different channels you can use to yeah. divert attention to your st store. Was it just Google, or like was it forums as well? Like getting these enthusiasts like excited about what you got on. A lot, lot, lot of lot of Google. Yeah, uh, a lot of content. Um, you could just put. A, so back then. You, you know, a lot of people hadn't farmed all the niches. So you could just find, find a little niche, put up a site and rank, you know, overnight. And then you'll, yeah. You know, you buy a domain name that's exact match and then, you know, jam it up and you're off, you're good, yeah. good to go, you know. Um, that stuff worked. It's like and, the gold rush of the internet back then, right? Yeah. And Google, I, you know, obviously we experienced a, a bunch of penalties mm -hmm. as well. I pushed it pretty hard. Yeah. We'll like, get into that. I want yeah. to speak about that whole channel. <laughs> I, I, can, I can only imagine we've had some challenges pop up um with my businesses since we've launched with different regulations changing or whatnot and i remember those moments like we came because we got a, our product is like a at home laser hair removal handset essentially it's oh, similar wow. to that but it's ipo and and we were the first ones to launch that product properly in australia and about 18 months after we launched we get a knock on the door essentially from the tga saying you can't sell this so it's like, I know what it feels like to get those moments where like my whole business is essentially screwed in my moment. So we'll get to that. Essentially for people listening, we'll get into 85% of their traffic lost from a, from, a, from a considerable business back then in the click of a fingers to build back from that. Did you see the Ninja Sword? No, I haven't. I, but I, I know the Ninja uh, Sword. I, you ha we have to get some content of that. Everyone's going to check that out in a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I want to go back to, to freestyle media. I think it's really interesting. So you were building websites for fun then. Oh, another thing. Sorry. Yeah. One more thing. I remember. This is going to sound even more bizarre. Yeah. We used to use banner ads. Banner ads on like different banner websites. Banner ads were a thing. Yeah. Like they, they worked. You'd work out the numbers. It's not like it'd be, it'd be pretty expensive, but they would work. Mm -hmm. People would click on them because they're just, they're always going on the web, mm -hmm. not on like Facebook or Instagram. You're going on the web, like the like websites. When I yeah. Say, I say web. On the web. <laughs> And so banner ads were like putting a billboard up. Mm. It's like, you know, you put billboards up here, outside, out of home. It's the same kind of thing. And I'm sure like back then in terms of like the attention of people on a website, everything's novel. So it's like, you're not like nowadays you're on a website and it's got a thousand different like banner ads and different ones. Like you kind of like tune it out. But back then, like same with everything, like more in my world, Ecom, like influencer marketing, like five years ago, you put a, pro a product in any influencer's hand, they smile, take a photo, it would sell like crazy. Nowadays, people are so used to seeing that, they mm. tune it out and, and it blends in. But back then, everything would have been so different. Um, so, okay, so yeah, but running banner ads and all that stuff. Now with- I was going to say, Dylan, one thing if I can add. Yeah, just please, on that, please, yeah. And build on that is I've seen all sorts of um, tactics mm -hmm. and they, they come and they go. Yeah. Um, they all get arbitraged away. You know, there's arbitrage. Nothing then, lasts forever, right? No, it's just like the Yellow Pages was a hack before. Yeah, you yeah, know, shit. Triple A plumbers, yeah. they, they appeared at the front of the book. They weren't any different to any other plumber. They just got all the calls. Yeah. And, you know, then that sort of came through. I think, I think yeah, so I think what's important, but and I think what may, maybe is instructive if, if you're experiencing this, I don't know if anyone's listening and experiencing this, I'm sure – even with your business, if For you imagine sure. there's channels, like what do you do when your ch main channel has been arbitraged away? Like, or it's getting arbitraged. And every every channel is slowly decaying because mm -hmm. everyone can it eventually figures it out and they copy pastes to some extent, right? And so you, you're going to get more competition, not less over time. And I think what's what I, what I think about that, and, and I think this is where um, it's taken me a long time to, to, to process this, but work through this, but is... Um, you need to work on your product. Mm -hmm. Product's the ultimate marketing. Product's the ultimate hack. Um, because what I've, you know, you, what you do is you go back up the chain and you go to actually changing the product itself to be unique, different, compelling in some way, shape or form. So is that you don't, you, you basically hack that. Yeah. So is that it has cut through. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give a reference here. You're probably going to need to play this back for everyone, but it's um, there's a guy, um, he sells a TV oven. Okay, a TV oven, yeah. A TV oven, right? His name's Ron. 
We've got to try and get this for up for the clip. That's this clip's, this clip's next level. Right? Ron <laughs> comes out on stage. It's a 30 minute clip, mm-hmm. 20, 20, 30 minute clip. This yeah. is back, you know, in TV, everyone watched TV. Yeah. Because it was in like a couple of channels, you know. So it was like, again, that was the channel, that was the hack, right? He built this this oven, right? And you watch his oven and he just sells the food you can make, you know? This, like, 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 you're like, he's just like, the food is so beautiful coming out. He's just pulling out chicken and lamb and roast and all this stuff, right? And he, he growth hacked the TV channel. Right, like the ovens were invented a long time ago. Ovens are done, but he reinvented the product so that what the product looked like was at the front was a beautiful screen, like a window, so you could see the the meat moving mm-hmm. inside it or the fish or whatever. And so for a TV, you took a beautiful shot of it's it. It's perfect medium. Yeah, and so you see this. So he 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 just basically adjusted the product to look a little different, mm-hmm. and suddenly this thing sold. Yeah. Because it fit the medium. And I think, you know, if you go back to the original guys of advertising, you know, they said the message is the medium. That's the ultimate line, right? That's, that's that, that, that idea that you need to go back and think about, you know, where are you putting your thing? How are you, how are you delivering that? And, and um, basically growth hacking that channel to a large degree. And that's what they would do. That, that this is, that's, a, that's, that's where you go, okay, I need to go and fix the product change that well regardless like even like the e-com world like regardless of how good your marketing is if your product isn't solid like if you don't have the product level first and, and I, I mentor people starting e-com businesses and it's really difficult when they come to me and they've already got a product and already started with a business and it's just like look at like let's break down the criteria of what we want to look for in a good product and this is just not ticking enough of the boxes regardless of how good your marketing is or if you're a growth hacker or if you can run facebook ads better than anyone if you haven't ticked the fundamental box of a good product that solves a problem and so it provides a solution to something for someone yeah it's going to be very difficult to have success for anything more than a few months. Like it's just not possible, but still, I think regardless finder and everything that you've built, you know, from 20, 2006 to now almost 20 years in the game, I'm sure the product would have changed and you would have had to make sure that you're staying ahead of the competition, but still to stay in business in such a highly competitive space that you're in for almost 20 years now, clearly you would have had to spot trends and opportunities coming up with new opportunities to market on different channels or different networks or whatever like whatever that was the 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 new wave at the time mm. there would have been loads as in in the last 20 years what skill or what did you, what would you put it down to your ability to spot these opportunities and move on them and get those for because it's always the first like couple of years before mass adoption comes where you get the really good value one of my big mentors is Gary V like he said the same thing like I wish I spent more on Google ads and email back in the day like to really squeeze the juice out of that channel mm-hmm. before everyone else gets to it. What would you put that down to? Like, is it is it yourself? Is it building great teams? How have you been able to stay up the top for so long? You know, I think um, I think maybe it starts with myself. You know, and obviously, in any any founders inside any organization, and, and some organizations don't have founders anymore, and they have brilliant people that are leading them. Um. But it starts from a culture of um, constantly reinventing yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, if you look at me over time, like I'm, I'm always moving. I'm always reinventing myself continuously um, because the most uh, – this is just something the way I think of it is the, mo- the darkest place in the world is just outside the spotlight. I love that quote. It's like – just it's the worst yeah like you've left the spotlight you're out of the zeitgeist Mm -hmm. you're no longer relevant like you know that that to me is where you need to you need to follow the follow the 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 spotlight and and the ball just to a large degree and i I think that's painful Mm -hmm. inside organizations very painful because you have to constantly deconstruct things and then rebuild them and deconstruct them and rebuild them and move these resources around right and that's not a natural state. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a value, there's five values in Finder. And the third one is called go live, which is basically have a bias to putting things live on the internet. Mm-hmm. So everyone knows that here. It's like, we're going to go live. We're doing this. Like, this is a go live culture. We're like, do it now. Let's go. Let's go live. Do it. Let's go. Yep. Like, we're just going to put, we're just going to launch this on the internet and see what happens. Well, it's and- either you win or you, you, you learn, right? And the, in, the, in the yeah. internet space, like in, in anything online, like the, the quicker you can learn, the quicker you can improve, the quicker you can get ahead of the competition. Yeah, I think that culture. So, th- so I think the first thing is the founders. The second one is that culture. The third one, and that comes from the values. Mm. 
you know, imbuing those and being those and living those. And then people like, you know, they're written on the wall. They're, they're through the meetings, they're through performance reviews, they're through everything, right? Like it's like a, yeah. it's got to trickle through the organization. Um, and then, you know, we, 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 you can see there's like a rocket ship theme here because go live's a rocket ship and mm -hmm. we like going live here. We're like, we're going to put things out there. It's like, you know, constantly doing that. That's, that's what we do at Finder. Um, and it's always been that way. I don't know. I it just don't know where that exactly, that mindset. I think I used to, this is going to, the, so so before like, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know all the big internet marketing guys these days, but before those guys, there's, I used to, I actually bought DVDs back in the day. Uh, so my first, I bought, I bought an info pack way back in the day. And I can't remember the guy's name. He's not, he's not, he's not even, I don't think he's even around yeah. anymore. He might be if I went and researched it. I think it cost me $1,500 US. Yeah. And back then as well. That's huge money. Crazy. It's like double, it's like, so three grand Australian. And I, I was making $1,500 a month. Um, That's like how much I was So this on. is like early on in your journey, you're doing this This is stuff? like, oh, four. Yeah. Like back then. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, we, we were, we were doing SEO and like I was learning SEO and mastering that and landing pages and um, email and. You know, I remember back then he said something and, and I never forgot it. He said, every day, just do, make it, make, just, 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 just make one improvement. Just one. And I'm like, oh, I suppose we could do that. You know, be, and he said like, if you do that every day yeah, and, and you can't do this every single day, but let's, let's say there's 220 working days in the year, roughly give or take. If you do 220 improvements, you're probably going to get somewhere. And so I was always just saying to everyone, like, I just want one thing to everyone. Mm -hmm. I just say, do one thing today, get one thing out. And that turned into this go live yeah. culture. Um, I, I think the following where the ball's going, I think that's uh, a different skill. It's, a, it's yeah, that's much more, I, I think it's nuanced. I think it's mm -hmm. about translating what's happening in the world to the trends of humanity and the behaviors that they're going to exhibit and then delivering your product to meet that. That's a, I think that's a, that's a really tough thing to do. Well, that's a skill that you've obviously leveraged, not just across business, but across all your investments in the crypto space, right? Yeah. For, for yourself, do you, obviously you've spoken about like actually getting in there. You were really involved with the coding in the early days. Would you say that you're a technical founder or are you more the creative visionary? Because there's something I really mm. like about the way you speak about your cre creativity and it's creativity as the conductor and the director rather than the end creative yourself. Is that, that observation you had in terms of your skill set and your strength, is that something you had earlier on? Is that something that you've developed your, your decades in business and with Finder and then all your crypto investments and you've fine-tuned the ability to conduct the team to be creative and to be innovative rather than having to drive every new idea yourself? I think it's a great, uh, great insight as well and good read on myself. Um, definitely in the beginning I was that coder and I was hands-on. I remember one day – the team moved out of tape. They stopped doing tables and started doing CSS and um, divs. Mm -hmm. And that's that, that, I remember that change in that moment in time. It's kind of a weird moment in time. And I was like, why don't we just keep using tables? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> and everyone's like, man, like, you know, look at all this. And I'm like, I don't understand. And I was like, fine, you guys just code. I'll do some other stuff. And then I was like, okay, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I realized like I'm not, you know, I was much better at bringing the business in and I just focused on that and, you know, sold a lot of more ideas to people, mm -hmm. you know, in the agency. It's all about, it's, it's an idea factory. It's a story factory and you're just constantly selling it. And that, that taught me to come up with ideas continuously. Um, I was, um, I was at a, you know, do you know Stephen Bartlett? He like the, he's like a big British, he's on like Dragons yeah. Den. He's got the Die of a CEO podcast. I was at his event last week and he was talking about his strengths as an entrepreneur and he, and, he, and he likened Richard Branson to this as well. He's like, I might not be the best in any one technical skill, but in terms of seeing the vision and bringing people into that, that's one of the biggest skills an entrepreneur can have. Yeah. What would you say, and I know it's difficult to get put on the spot with these sorts of questions, in terms of like, look at all the awesome shit you've been able to accomplish. What do you think is the one skill or trait that you have that has been the most pivotal to everything that you've been able to build? Hmm. Skill. I think I um, take the data, the customer, my experience, uh, my technical understanding, and I compile that together. I, I call it synthesize it together 
to a single action that's extraordinarily simple. Mm. And simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. That's what Leonardo da Vinci said. It's extraordinary. Like, you know, all this data about what's going on, we should do this and have conviction and go. And then the thing I add is with that is a very, is, is a lateral thought to go, okay, everyone's doing that. This is how it's going to play out. So I used to, I used to play, I was the captain of the chess team at school. Sounds unusual, but, um, I was literally like all the smart kids, I would beat them in chess. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I just, the way my mind Your works. Your mind works like that, that, yeah. It works that, that mm-hmm. way. They were smarter than me academically. So you could see like multiple steps ahead, essentially. Yeah. And then I could see what's going to happen and I could see the nuance and the psychology and the feeling. I'm not saying like I'm the, like chess is a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's a closed space game and it's not representative of the world. The world is not a closed space game. It is a game where you can bring in anything. There's unlimited game. inputs, right? Yeah. Potential. It's it's un it's like it's literally, oh, I'm gonna bring a camel with my brand on the side of it to this event. And no one else thought of that marketing technique in the moment. Yeah. It's like, but now you got all the attention and you win you win one internet to you, sir. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That, that 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 the game's not fair. It's not a it's not like that, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's and it's also never ends. So if you lose a game you can reset the board and go again and again because the game's net doesn't it doesn't stop and then like massive things happen to it and that's why you can it's not straight line so so that ability is only part of it it's only you can only set and see certain and it's about probabilities about how much forward you can see it's more like i see the pattern i see intuition and something i actually listened inside myself and go for some reason i think we need to go over here and i don't know why and i listen to that and then everyone's looking at me and going, why would you say that? Why would you do that? And I'm like, I'm not sure. Let's go and try and unpack it. And mm-hmm. normally like I will unpack that back to an actually extremely differential, logical, rational approach. We'll take that a few. And then suddenly, you know, we look different to everyone else. And so you're zigging rather than zagging. You know, everyone's like, when crypto started, everyone was like, oh, that's a scam. And we were like, no, nah, I don't think that's a scam. <laughs> we're going to go all in and mm-hmm. take, you know, a large amount of that market share. Yeah. Um, and people wanted to compare that stuff. Yeah. You know, they wanted to know. Um, so that was a good good move for, for Finder. I think then people copy that. And there's a lot of people who just sit back and copy Finder and they just, you know, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And I get it. They don't know where we're going to go next and they don't know where we've been and what we, our reasons are. But we just – one thing you – you can never take away from us, which is, I think, again, that uniqueness is we're never going to stop creating. Mm. We're going to always be creating. And that that is what drives growth. Yeah, and that's what differentiates you to everyone else, particularly if they're all modeling off Finder, right? But you, you mentioned something interesting. I always like to understand the decision-making and the thought process from high-level entrepreneurs. Now, talk about like you've got this feeling, it's a balance of you observing humanity and what's going on around, a bit of intuition and you reading the data and seeing the trends. But you, you said like, you're not sure why, but you need, you, you, you make a decision and you go with it with purpose and you, and you believe in it. Are you someone that wants to be 100% sure? Or are you, I just need to be 51% sure. And then we're going to m- move fast and move forward. And then if it's right, awesome. If it's wrong, we can pivot and learn. How do, how far do you need to be certain on something before you get the wheels in motion? Obviously you've got the value of go live. So speed is obviously a big part of the process, but where do you think you sit on that spectrum of being certain on a decision and, and being certain enough? Do you need to be hundred percent certain to go forward with conviction or do you just trust the process so much? Uh, I like, I'm like, good. I normally, that 50% would be high. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. I'm normally like 15 to 20. Okay. And you're like, let's explore this. Yeah. Like we just, this is the right, I smell, this is the right. I've seen this before. I think we need to go over here and we take a few steps and normally we'll run an experiment first of, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, wherever I'm operating and then bring that back. And then normally it's going to be, they're all going to be misses to, yeah. some, to a large degree. Like yeah. that's very normal and comfortable, but you're like, you, it's more the data. What did you learn from these misses? And then you're like, okay, okay, let's take that. And we'll go and like experiment again. And then eventually that comes to, to something. Right. Um, and normally what it normally happens is some other piece of catalyst or input you didn't know existed now becomes relevant. Mm. And, and if I was to, I'll give you an analogy. Um, 
let's imagine you're standing in a field and on your left was like a forest and in front of you, like way down the back was like these mountains and there were like these rolling hills in front of you and um, on, you, on your right was like the ocean. And that like kept going out for both of the, all, everything's gone out to like beyond you can see. And you're like, okay, you know, we need to get somewhere and you're not actually sure where do I go in the forest? Do I go in the ocean? Do I go, but somewhere out there is like a, it's a gold mine. Like it's like a serious amount of value. And the way I think of it is like, okay, well let's just go over that hill or let's just go into the forest for like 10 minutes or let's just paddle out to the ocean for like, you know, five minutes so we can still just check it out. And on that journey, right? So I call this wandering. You like wander over the, the hill, right? Let's say we choose the hill. And once you get over the hill and as you're going over, you're like, oh, that forest, actually, that was not a, yeah, that's good. We didn't go over there because <laughs> that was just half a forest, mm-hmm. you know? And the ocean, geez, that, that doesn't look like there's nothing out there. I can see much higher now. But this hill, uh, there's another hill in front of us and I don't know where any gold is yet, but we definitely know that those places weren't the go. The go. And at least I'm closer to the mountains because maybe there's probably some gold in there and I've heard about that. And I can kind of see some strange, interesting things ahead. Like now I've got like a, a desert and I've got a, a rainforest and it's like, hmm, these are interesting. And there's a river over there. Oh, that could be interesting. And so, you know, in terms of your idea, you're like, okay, like I start from an idea, a kernel and I'm like, okay, this is where this idea goes. And you sort of imagine you design it or you just put something down on a piece of paper and you show someone and then they say something and you're like, oh, that's interesting. And now you're wandering, right? You're not trying to get anywhere. Cause you don't even know where you're going, but you just got to lean into that experience, that feeling. And in that moment, you're like, okay, we're just wandering with ideas. And then what happens is like, oh, that river's there. That's nice. Oh, maybe we should go down the river. Cause that's going to get us a lot more places, a lot faster. And so you take that and whoosh. Now you're speed running. You're wandering maybe. And, and that's the process, right? That's the, that's the journey. And maybe you eventually stop and you go, okay, let's just stop camp here. And we'll dig here. This looks like a pretty good idea for a piece of gold. And we'll go, like, we have high conviction. We've seen a little bit. There's a lot of natives that have been around here. Like, other people have been mining here. Okay, this is interesting. We should go and, like, at least go and have a look. And then you're going to go and figure out. That's, then there's a whole series of other journeys, right? But mm-hmm. but that, 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 that wandering idea, all you're trying to do is get to the next horizon. Would you say that's a good analogy for the path that Finder's got on? Like in terms of the exploration, like you, you start the journey and then you'll get all these new info in, and input and information and then you might go this way, then that way. And like that continuous creativity and innovation is the way you've been able to come so far in 20 years? 100%. Yeah. Just we've done all, like, done all sorts of things and all sorts of things have failed. And mm-hmm. Like there's all sorts of stuff that have been gone and launched for Finer and then of course. died and no one really cares. On that as well, now, I want to talk about the way you approach things in terms of that analogy you just gave, but I want to, the way that you just, you've got, an, you've got a feeling about something, hey, I'm not sure about where this will go, but something's telling me from the information I'm taking in about the world, about the technologies that are developing, hey, I feel like in terms of the crypto space or Web3 or blockchain, there's something of really of interest to me in this way. Now, I know you've made a lot of money, it's well um it's well covered, made a lot of money investing in crypto, but also building businesses off the back of the technology itself. Mm. How do you, again, is it a, maybe it's a similar process, but it's something I wanted to ask you. How do you move forward in terms of not just investing in crypto in terms of what, what assets you're going to hold, what coins you're going to hold, but in terms of how do you spot the opportunity for a business and then decide you run it through your own um, internal thought process? Mm. Like, hey, there's actually something in this. Let's explore turning this into a business. Well, I think it's like making a business in a new emerging frontier as like placing an investment of capital to get a passive continuous flow of, you know, of income in that space. If there, if there's, if there's a something as you've been going along, you've realized, oh, this process I'm doing for myself. If I, if I package that process into a little system, that's a business. And so one of them was, you know, I was buying large amounts of, and, you know, and selling large amounts of cryptocurrency overseas and over the counter. So not through an exchange. It was just like, I would like literally WhatsApp and say, Hey, I need like, you know, 150 grand. Um, what's the price? It's this. Okay, cool. Here's my address. I sent the money. 
done. Mm-hmm. There was like six text messages yeah. for 150 grand trading. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. And I was like, why does no, I realized no one else has access to this in Australia. And so we said, that's when we set up the desk. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, let's just make a desk that does this for people. And that was a nice little business and that, that, that ran. Um, I think it was because I was like, oh, you know, here's a little, a, a, a little business that will work. Let's just spin that off. Um, I think in pure web three businesses, it's much harder. It, it's, it's like, it like, like internet businesses versus bricks and mortar run at like, like say, uh, 10x the speed, like the, the life of them is like, whoop, and then like, you know, it kind of dies or it like survives or whatever, right? Crypto companies are like 100x. <laughs> yeah. They're like literally come, they form, they come up big and then they just die. And then yeah. it's like, it's like, it's all over. And it's like, that was the cycle. Mm-hmm. It was the same cycle every other business. It just happened in 100x the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, that's that's my mindset of that. I think that that moment of decision about, yeah, whether you just, I'm going to do this one off and move on or not. I think it needs to, it's an assessment of, is there a, a process that I can package up and continuously run in order to make a sustained amount of, you know, profit? Uh, and if there is, sometimes it's like, is it worth the time? That's another thought now. It's like, oh, I, like I see these all the time. I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. But then I was like, you know, I think this morning I woke up, it was like 3 a.m. because I was, you know, helping. Uh, I've got a three-month-year-old baby. And I was like, um, I was just picking him up and like soothing him. And then um, this idea came to me. I'm just going to share this. So the, here's, my, here's, my, here's my latest business idea. If anyone does this, send it to me. <laughs> I was like, what if you made a market for pe- having lunch with someone? So it's like a bid off a market, right? So let's say I want to have a, like lunch with Elon. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what are the bids? How much would you pay to have a seat at the table with Elon right now? Like, and then imagine people just like, oh, 10 grand, uh, 25, you know, and it's like, this is the price of having five people at your table. And that's how much people would willing, willingly pay. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was like, I was like, because, and there would be other people like, there's different markets for different people. But someone could go, actually, I'm going to go and raise some money for someone. And yeah, I'll take um, f- top eight bids right now. Here's my price. Boom, boom, boom. Raise this money. Boom. I have lunch with them. And, on it's 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 good to go, so 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 Buffett does this every year. You know he sells off. He has a, has ten people at Smith and Walensky in New York, sells the ten seats, um, and he's been doing that. You know, I don't know for how long, mm-hmm. but he raises money, right? And I was just thinking, like, how much is someone's time worth? Essentially, it's like a bid for your time, of course. And and I just I don't know. It was just a market, and I think it could happen in crypto really nicely. That can go also to some really weird places. I was yeah. thinking, like that could go. It's just a really unusual bid off a market for all sorts of strange things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but just my that's where my mind went. I was like, is that a business? I don't know. Is it defensible? I don't know. Doesn't seem like it. And it was just a fantasial idea I had at 3 a.m. Well, on that as well, like you talk about you've got a three-month-old now, your fourth your fourth child, and you've got all these businesses, you've got a massive the business finder, you've got all these investments across crypto. In terms of just like mental capacity, and that's another thing you like, is it worth the time? Is it worth the mental space inside your head to cut off another 10% or 20% of the very limited brain power you have and put it towards this. How do you navigate this? And this is something I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs, whether they're early or whether they're mid-level entrepreneurs, um, that they are struggling with taking on too many things and not being able to manage the stress or pressure. How have you been able to navigate that and manage that for you know two decades in the game or plus? I think, um, you know, uh, one thing... Let's, let's do an assessment of history and some of the largest fortunes that have been made throughout you know, time. Um, start with, say, um, Rockefeller, um, who monopolized oil in America. And I say that word monopolized because the government broke up Standard Oil into eight different companies. That's why I've got Exxon and all these mm-hmm. mobile, because they were literally owned by the family and they had to forcibly split them and bring in other shareholders. Like they made a lot of money, you know, and that's why the Rockefeller centers are in the middle of Manhattan. Um, that's a whole other story, right? But what did he do? He specialized in oil. Mm-hmm. He went all in. He focused deeply on one thing. Um, let's let's think about, you know, um, another one. Um, Henry Ford. Henry Ford's entire goal was to make, in 1901, he set up the Ford Motor Company after working at several other motor companies and making cars in Detroit. 
for he, his goal was to make the everyday man's car because a car used to cost like you know 10 grand and the average salary was 300 bucks a year and so he was like well no one could buy a car right so but cars were like super rare it's like whoa you got a car like i got a horse you know like <laughs> So horses were like, you know, like, like, like Internet Explorer and like Chrome <laughs> like rolled out, you know, like, and um, the problem was it was in, it's just way too expensive. So he said, okay, I'm going to make a product. I'm going to make this car. I'm going to make it for the everyday man. And he went through the car, like all 10,000 pieces of it and reduced the weight, reduced the cost. He like took the wood out of cars. used to have wood in them to like hold them together took the wood out, put like other metal, cheaper metal. And he went through the entire car end to end continuously and broke that car down until it cost, you know, 600 bucks or something like that. And then that's why we had the proliferation of cars on our streets. There were not like, like that, there are all these cars around that people could drive around really inexpensively. That's what Henry Ford created on this earth. Yeah. Um, and he focused, he's like, he, dedicated himself to this over over years and years and years and years to make that motor car happen. And I think what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like diversification is a basically, you, you, you know, and this is what Byron Buffett says, that diversification is basically you know, like alpha and beta. So alpha, beta returns, like what's the market going to give you? You may as well just buy an ETF. Yeah. Get your money. Don't go and start a business. Just buy an ETF and go and work somewhere else and just keep putting money in your ETF. That was probably a better strategy for a lot of people. Like because they just don't have a greater idea. That's actually a good strategy, right? The like market's gonna pay you what everyone else is basically gonna yeah. get. An alpha strategy is okay, I've got the beta returns. I can do something that will receive basically get higher returns. In order to get higher returns, so what Byron Buffett basically boils down one of the he says many things by the way, but I'm, and I'm sort of paraphrasing, but this is what I believe as well is that if you know and have alpha on a particular company and you should go and pick stocks, then you should concentrate your investment. He talks about it, you know, you've got 10 punch cards, you got a punch card with 10 punches, you get to choose 10 things you're gonna do, and that's it. You don't get to choose anymore. Those are the 10 companies you're gonna buy, and you're gonna hold them, and you're gonna like stay with them. And you're going to research and you know be with them, and you're going to keep buying more of them, and that's what he does. He just constantly he choose, finds these great companies, right? Same thing. Imagine a business. If you've gone and planted a stake in the ground to go and make this business, you've done that for a reason. Yeah. So that's one of your punch cards, and until you sell that, or you know something happens, so you close it down, or or it, you you've committed to that, and so concentration of investment is the way to a great fortunes, not diversification. Yeah, I've learned a lesson in diversification um, and simplification. I, um, as someone who experienced success quite quick in in, in ecom, um, you know, two three years into the process, you start to want to do all these things and have branch off and have all these different you know ideas, which is great. And then what I've realized over the last two years, I've just been culling down, culling down until it's a much smaller group, more concentrated, so they all leverage off each other and the power of momentum is so much greater. So that's a lesson I've experienced in my own life. A um, couple of questions I want to ask before we before we wrap up. Now, this is a bit of a change of topic, but I really want to ask you because I think it's really interesting. Now, one of your beliefs, for lack of a better word, is that in some way, shape or form, you believe like the overarching purpose of like human beings is to finally bridge that gap between the physical and the digital and find a way to recreate ourselves in a way that is infinite and isn't limited by the physical limitations of, you know, being, being mad or being able to, you know, transport yourself ideas across time and space and all that sort of stuff. I found that so fascinating. I want to know where did that, where did that seed of that belief come from and maybe unpack it a little bit if you could. Yeah. So, um, I think one of the, if you assess, you know, time travel, um, and, and this is sort of a slightly, you know, in some places, I'm not going to say like I'm like a quantum physicist or anything, but like some of the limitations, constraints are the idea of us being organic matter is kind of like, you know, it makes us actually very vulnerable in space. Space is a brutal place, very brutal. Um, you know, lacks oxygen and atmosphere is not super nice. Earth, Earth is like chill. <laughs> it's like It's like a holiday park. And it, it regulates itself. It's like the human body almost. You mm -hmm. know, this, this body just constantly keeps itself at nice, this nice temperature. Everything's nicely regulated. That's incredible that it happens. 
so, you know, because we're not that fit for that, um, and I think of like this evolution into, you know, from organic um, energy and, and matter into inorganic and digital um, matter in some way, shape or form, this transition point where the two are at some point going to be very similar. Like they, they get to such a point. And if you go back in time, like humans on this earth, right? Like we were like sixth to the meal in the food chain. It's like like the big lions would eat. Then like the hyenas would come along and like we would come along with like these blunt hands and these little teeth and like we were like slightly hunched over. We were like, we sucked. Like we would get beaten up pretty bad. So we were like sixth in, get the little pieces of bone and meat and, and stuff. Like we were, we, and we've gone from like sixth to like number one. And and what what drove that is, you know, technology. Technology. You know, so so you look at that, like look at that trajectory, right? So that's a that's a that's like hundreds of thousands of years, that's a good trajectory. So let's go and like, I just, you know, I really looked at it and I said, okay, let's just go and like e- extrapolate that. Like if you imagine humanity, like we're going to go and like, like, I was just down at the, you know, Leukemia Center, the, the research lab there for cancer. You, you can see it on my Instagram because I'm, you know, shaving my head for, to raise money. And I was looking at the cells, right? And these cells, they're literally growing the cancer cells. Then they're going and getting the other cells and going and killing them. In the lab. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, whoa, so you're like custom killing cancers inside people. Like that's what they're doing. They're yeah. literally delivering this inside humans. And 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 people have survived obviously from this stuff, right? So let's just imagine that's a that's an insane concept and idea, the number of things that you need to go and get breakthroughs for. But let's just assume now where we are today, and then there's probably gonna be a bunch of things that we're gonna need to go and solve to get look really out there, get interstellar and stuff like that. And one of them I think is this organic issue. And, and that needs to be where you're digitally comparably equal organic or not or inorganic. And you're about the same person. So like on my, in my, in my will, um, I'll share this is that if, if I'm brought back to life as an AI or a computer, my assets come back to me. <laughs> like I've written that in, yeah. the, in the thing, yeah. right? because I yeah. just, I just forecast it. I'm like, well, you know, freeze me up for a while, and then like when 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 all the stuff's sorted, just bring me back and bring me back to this computer. I'm cool with that because I'm mm. that's probably where we're going, right? Yeah. Um, and so you know, w- like one of the big risks I think in the universe is just a very explosive, um, unemotional, um, chaotic place. And in order to decrease our you know chances of destruction, and there's been like I think 26 entire extinctions on Earth that have happened, like just nukes going off. Mass extinctions, yeah. Mass extinctions. So we need to get off this place and hedge a bit um, in order to survive. Um, And either that or um, we can just take our chances, which I think you're probably more likely that humans will probably go and kill themselves rather than like something else. It's looking that way. It's going pretty quick. (laughs) Um, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. But even like, if you talk about, yeah, like over a couple hundred thousand years we've got there, but just look how far we've gone the last 20 years. And then Elon with Neuralink, we're getting closer and closer. It like genuinely could be by the end of the century where this stuff is very much a, a real possibility. So I think it's really a fascinating thing to, to talk about. I want to, I want to just ask you one thing now, as I said, you've been in, in business for 20 years, you know, I know I don't like talking about like personal net worth, but you, anyone researches your name multiple nine figures. There's a lot of different valuations around there. You've gone from someone who, again, and this is, this is like, I think some of the most motivating shit for anyone out there. You went from, you're living in a share house with five people, eating tin spaghetti, like tin spaghetti every night for dinner, working at Pizza Hut. So this guy that's built like a massive fortune and built a massive business worth at the latest valuation, 650 million. How do you still continue to be so eager to innovate and continue to push? What is that big driving factor for you? It's clearly not money. If it was money, you would just, okay, go chill, you know, invest in different projects and put your feet up on the beach in the, in the crypto castle. What is it for you that keeps you going and keeps you motivated to strive for more and more creation and, and, and continue to build? You know, I think um, I, I don't think I've actually delivered my greatest creation. Like I've built some things and I think they're pretty cool. But I think it's led me to now, and I'm a much better version of myself than I was before. 
And I think I can go and create something that'll have so much impact on individuals and create so much freedom for them that I, you know, that, that, that's what I'm striving for. I feel, you know, it's like, I'm still rolling the same dice. Yeah. Like everyone else is rolling them, but I'm like, I can probably do like some pretty, I can do some much more advanced moves and I'm much calmer in myself. I've grown, you know, emotionally uh, and I can see through the matrix a bit better, not perfectly, but like, you know, just a, just a bit better that when that idea or that concept or that execution comes, I think I can create something like even bigger than I've ever created. And, you know, I think the, the reason is the, why do I do that? Um, I, I just, I think I'm driven a lot by legacy. You know, I, I want to, you know, I think about like the guys I love is like, you know, Benjamin Franklin, like the guy's like a polymath, you know, like, He's a scientist. He's a business guy. He's like all these sorts of like just just and I, I love that 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 concept of that idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm unfortunately or fortunately um, constantly just I'm not sure why exactly, but I just love. I'm curious and I'm um, I get bored as well. <laughs> so I'm like and 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 let's be let's be really brutal about this world that we're in most of human life is suffering. Like we're literally trying to deal with our internal um, suffering of our existence. We're like, we've conquered survival and we're all sitting out. We're basically all actually are sitting. We could, we're pretty much all sitting on the beach, like to a large degree. Like, okay, that's not all of humanity. There's a lot of other challenges as well. Like, but like in, in Australia, particularly, in, in, you know, I think in America, there's obviously different you know, places. Obviously in Australia, there's a, but, but largely, if you go and put a bunch of effort in, pretty much anyone could like, you know, at least one day a week sit on the beach and, you know, to some extent, right? It depends on what, what you're aiming for, right? And how, how much, where that, that thing is. But I think if that's the case, um, then what does it look like if you go and fully commit, fully go and stretch yourself to your max and go and like pe- you operate at your peak mental, physical, emotional, like all three categories that you've maxed them out. And you're like, what does that look like? What is that ultimate creation you've made from that? Mm-hmm. And I want to see that. And I want to bring that to, 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 to humanity because I reckon it'll have a big impact. Well, you mentioned creating freedom for humanity and creating freedom for people, tools and businesses or whatever these things. I think that's one of the greatest gifts you can give to humanity giving people tools to create more freedom for themselves. Because like you said, most of the shit that goes around is a lot of suffering. So I think that's massive. And I know you've grown a lot personally. You just mentioned it as well. You've grown a lot personally, a lot more calmer in understanding yourself. And I'm sure understanding your emotions and the way your actions can affect other people as well. And you talk about wanting to execute in the highest different, to the highest different, to the highest possible level on all those three factors. But that comes out of personal sacrifice. Is that something you've had to experience yourself? And if I was to say, let's let's wrap up in a few minutes, Fred, if I was to say, hey, you're on your deathbed, what's the biggest life lesson you've learned that you'd want to pass on? Not about businesses and making money. What would that be for you? Yeah, I think I, I've um, – I'm not saying like I take a perfect line. And everyone has their own line um, about what they're going to do and how they go and approach things. And I think I just take a, a relatively – um, motivated, concerted and focused effort to go and strive to achieve things that I want to go and achieve. I just, that's how I want to operate. That's what mm-hmm. I want. That's what I want to do with my time. Um, and if you want to go and do that, like that's, that's what I do. That's what I, I live and breathe all the time. Like it's what I, I like, I talk about this continuously. I read about it. I, I'm voraciously surround myself with people who like that as well. You know, if I think if I was on my deathbed <laughs> and, and, and say the question again. So if I was on my deathbed and you would ask me. Like what, apart from all this business knowledge, right? What's the biggest life personal lesson that you think you've taken away from this experience so far? Yeah, I think this has probably dawned upon me. It's taken probably, yeah, a good 40 years to figure out. Um and I think a lot of people say this, but I think 
I, I'm going to try and frame it so that it really lands. Um, I think everyone deep inside themselves when they're like in a quiet moment, your mind goes back to something and it's something you love. It goes back to it continuously and it goes back to it and it goes back to it and it goes back to it. And then like you distract yourself and you go about your things and you say you're too busy and you fill your time bucket up with all sorts of rocks and sand and life happens. And there are parts where life happens. Like it's me awake at 3 a.m. holding a baby. Like I, there's not much else I can do at that point in time. Although my mind's thinking and I'm connecting with my child as best I can, you know. But in that moment and whatever that thing is, write it down. Just get it down on a piece of paper, whatever it is. It could be, even if it's silly or if it's whatever it is, if you love that thing, whatever it is, just 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 write it down and honor it. And every day work so as that more of your day is doing that rather than less. Whatever it takes. And, and, and the creativity to go and do that is the processes and systems that surround your life, the, the things you choose to say yes to and things you ch- say to no to. Because most of those yeses and nos, what they actually come down to is how much you're willing to honor what you wrote down. Because if you honor it that much and someone says to you, hey, do you want to go and do this cool thing on Saturday night? La la, you know, it's going to be you know, really fun. And you say, no. And it comes from a place of integrity comes from a place of honoring yourself, comes from a place of deep love to yourself and what you truly believe in. It's really comfortable. Another person hears that and goes, that's cool, no worries. And nothing, nothing, there's no tension in that because you're just honoring yourself. And that thing may change over time as well. And if you get bored, just, you know, you get a bit lost, go and take some time and go and find another one and just write it down. And, and I think that's what I've done throughout time. I just, you know, I wrote down one where, I said, I'm going to make a million dollars. Cool. I'm going to, you know, come back to my parents because, you know, they think, you know, this, uh, there was a story about my, you know, I went a different way that my parents are doctors and I left university in, you know, went on a different path. I said, I'm going to come back and show my ability. Then I said, well, I've done that. Okay. You sold this company. I'm 26 years old, you know, like, cool. I had to make another thing up, right? So then I thought, okay, let's go and make a business that makes money while I sleep because, you know, if you don't do that, then you basically have to be awake a lot um, <laughs> and you sleep a lot, right? So, you know, that's where sort of fun it came out of. And then now I'm at this point where I'm like, okay, that feels good. Now what I want to do is create my greatest creation to create the most amount of freedom I possibly can for humanity. And that's that's my newest thing. Like, you know, and that's what I want to do. I'm like, how do I maximize and give m- as many people as possible this feeling of, it's you know, financial freedom is a big part of that. But how do, I, how do I deliver that to as many people as I possibly can? And that's why I just, you know, constantly am thinking about that. It's a really powerful. And it's a really powerful message. Like when, when you started speaking of that instantly, I'm sure people listening to this will have the moment, that split second, as soon as you say that, you go into your own mind for a second and start thinking about what that means to you and what, what, what your greatest value is and what you really want to respect and honour. And Sometimes, you know, like life happens and you stray away from that. But if you can bring yourself back to that, I think. And like you said, over the years it will change. But if you're honoring what that really is in that moment and, and you try and honor that as much as you can in your life, I think you'll be, you know, going in the right direction and spending your time on the right things as much as possible. Now, you got the you got the world's greatest shave coming up early May. So that'll be about you know, a week or so after this podcast comes out. Apart from that, talk to me about your reason for that. Then what can people expect for you over the next, you and Finder over the next little bit? You know, like we're just we're gonna keep creating. So we're, we're yeah, there's a new finder coming out. Um, I would say uh, probably around June, um, may, may, maybe late May. Um, it's got a lot of AI in it. Um, it's like Finder 2.0. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been working on it deep in the silo <laughs> in the laboratory. Um, it. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Like it's it does a lot of the bits and a lot of things that you know. It's, it's using large language models to actually go and solve, you know, and help people make and save more money, mm-hmm. which is, you know, thank you so much, 
computer, I appreciate your help. Yeah. And like, and like in today's economy, particularly like even in Australia, yes, you're right. We do have a really great lifestyle and a really safe, great country, but still the cost of living crisis is affecting so many people. So if you can create yeah. something that even elevates 5, 10, 15, 20% of that, that's creating a lot of freedom and a lot more time to enjoy and be present in the moment for these people. So that's massive, man. I, I, I'll be watching even even more closely now that we've connected everything that you build and and create for your future. And for anyone that wants to follow you, you you're pretty active in terms of content creation. We just had Michelle in before looking at all the stuff you've got coming out soon. Where's the best place people can find you and follow along? Oh, I like I put some stuff out on Instagram. I'm not like a massive Instagram. I put you know on LinkedIn as well. But I um, yeah, I'm very curated in what I put out. Mm-hmm. So. I don't put out a lot of things, but what I do put out, I try and make it informative and interesting for you, for everyone's mind to think about. So, so definitely, um, probably Instagram's good. For yeah, us. and then um, over a hundred thousand followers on TikTok as well. I had a lot of fun going through some of that content. So, <laughs> Fred Chibesta, thanks so much, brother. I appreciate your time Thanks, and keep on creating. Thanks for listening, everyone, as well. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.